Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to our Wood Solutions webinar today, Timber Flooring Systems and Concerns. In the spirit of reconciliation, Forest and Wood Products Australia acknowledges the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia. We acknowledge their connection to the land and their custodianship of country and forest. We pay our respect to elders past and present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. So uh, I think most of you now would know a little bit about Wood Solutions. It's an industry-wide initiative resourced by Forest and Wood Products Australia. We're really there for all building professionals. Uh, we want to uh, inspire you to use timber in your projects. And then when you use them, we want to help you out with whatever information and resources you might need. So my name's Alistair Woodard, and I'm one of the Wood Solutions technical advisors. Wood Solutions uh, offers a range of different activities from events such as today, uh, in-house technical tutorials for 10 or more people in a business, if you've got that. Um, we sponsor the major organ um, building professional organisations. And importantly, we produce a whole range of technical design guides, which uh, we've got 53 at the moment, uh, all on our Wood Solutions website. In fact, one released just last week uh, around moisture management and mass timber construction, if you haven't seen that one. So um, we undertake a range of different events as well, and you can access that and see what's going on through the Wood Solutions calendar. Just tick on that events tab up the top. Um, with our webinars, we're, as you know, now doing those monthly. We were doing them uh, sort of um, fortnightly last uh, year, but we're now on to monthly webinars and we're starting to do our face-to-face -face seminars back in the individual states as well. In terms of the webinars, um, just a reminder that they are recorded. And if you want to go back and look at a webinar or you want to let your colleagues know about them, either go and uh, click on or put webinars into the search function or click on the resources um, link and under webinars, podcasts, videos and presentations, you'll go to this page. If you click on the Tuesday webinars, you'll be able to find uh, the webinar that's recorded today or the range of different webinars that we've held over the past two years. And there's some fantastic ones there. So just a reminder in interacting on today's webinar, if you want to chat amongst yourselves, um, use the chat function, just click on that all panelists and attendees. But most importantly, we're very keen to get your questions, which we'll handle at the last 10 minutes at the end. So uh, please post your questions under the Q&A tab. If you like a question, just click that thumbs up uh, button and that will actually then uh, bring those sort of um, questions up to the top and we'll work through as many questions as we can at, uh, at the end of the presentation. Also a reminder that you can claim CPD points for these presentations. Uh, there will be a couple of CPD questions, which I'll uh, go through shortly. You just need to keep them for self-assessment. You don't need to send any uh, answers to us. Uh, you will receive a certificate of completion within a week of attending the webinar. Just check your junk mail. If um, you, know, if you don't see it in your normal mail mailbox, sometimes they go into those uh, junk mail folders. Um, and if you've got any questions about your own uh, CPD points with your industry association, please contact them about them. Please store those certificates as well because we can't reissue them after each of the different webinars. So uh, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Phil Buckley. Phil is the Technical and Inspection Director with the Australasian Timber Flooring Association, as well as General Manager of Mint Floors in Sydney. Phil is a second generation timber flooring specialist. He has over 25 years of practical timber floor ex experience over that time as an installer, site supervisor, sales manager, project manager, general manager and director. Phil has been an after inspector for over seven years and has represented the flooring industry for the last three years on the industry reference committee that oversees development and maintenance of trade qualifications. Phil has a master's degree in teaching, a diploma in project management and the after diploma in timber flooring. In terms of the learning outcomes, we're hoping you'll get out of today's presentation. That's an understanding of the type of timber flooring product and systems available today, an understanding of the key points in laying a successful timber floor on the different substrates, an understanding of the types of performance or appearance issues that might occur with a timber floor over its life. In terms of the three CPD questions, and I'll put these into the chat function uh, shortly, um, list three key steps to a successful project list three types of floor coating systems, and list three possible problems that might occur with timber floors over their life. As I say, I'll put those into the chat function shortly for you. But without further ado, I'll stop sharing my screen and we'll hand over to Phil for his presentation. Good morning, everybody. I hope everyone can hear me and see me fine. I'm just gonna share my screen now. So we get a big thumbs up from Alistair if that's come through. No good. And we're off and running. So I'm Phil, as uh, Alistair mentioned, today we're going to be looking at timber floor systems and concerns. So we're going to be looking at 
fixed and floated systems and then coding systems that go with those. And then we're going to look at how to identify some of the main issues that we see in solid timber floors, engineered floors, and then some appearance concerns in sanding and coding. So we're going to jump straight into it. So as a lot of you would be aware, speaking to some educated timber people, um, timber flooring uh, is a hygroscopic material. So it expands and contracts with changes in humidity. So the most important property is that with seasonal weather changes, they shrink a little uh, when humidity is low, and then they swell a little under higher humidity conditions. And what we need to be aware of is that the installation of these products needs to take this into consideration. And a little chart there on the right shows us that our research over many years now shows that your average 80 millimeter wide board, you lose about 0.25 of a millimeter for every 1% change in moisture content. So that's that coefficient of expansion. But moving on. Different floor product types that we've got. So with timber flooring, we've got strip timber flooring, pre-finished solid timber flooring, which is becoming less popular in Australia. We've got engineered flooring, which is on the rise, and then parquetry across a few different ranges. And then you've got laminates, bamboos, and corks in the hygroscopic materials. So there's the ones that are wood or wood related. But of course, there's a whole bunch of vinyl-based products on the market now that um, don't affect wood solutions. So let's stay out of them. When we're doing floors, if the two real main ways to go about installing a timber or timber type floor is to do a fixed down system or a floating system. So fixed systems can be glued or nailed or a combination of both. So we might use uh, staples or nails um, through the tongue and groove or the surface of the board and usually with an adhesive. Now that can be straight to a plywood subfloor or a particle board. And obviously structural timber floors can go over joists and, and bearers. A floating floor is where the boards are fixed to each other, but they're not fixed to the substrate. So the best way to think of a floating floor is that they're platforms or rafts and they float on an underlay. So most floating floor systems these days, the vast majority will have a glueless locking system, sometimes referred to a click or a lock system, but there are still a few TMG, so tongue and groove profile floating floor systems where you put an adhesive in the joint, as you can see on the top photo there. So that's traditional floating floors were manufactured that way, but the vast majority of engineered flooring or floating floors are made with a glueless lock system these days. And you'll see many different types with many different um, the patented systems, but the glueless locking system for floating floors is certainly the most predominant on the market. So a little bit of a, a snapshot of the different ways to install the different products. So if we have a look at the little chart here on the right, we've got the different types of flooring or wood related flooring, and then whether you can install them fixed or floated. So with solid timber, it's important to know that it must be a fixed down system. Okay, so for a very brief period of time, pre-finished solid timber was manufactured as a floating floor, and it was a disaster as you could imagine. So solid timber and pre-finished solid timber, parquetry and cork, all need to be fixed systems. So whether that's glue and nail down or just glue down or just nail down, depending on the product, they need to be fixed to the substrate. Engineered and bamboo floors can be fixed or floated. So bamboo on the way out, but engineered certainly is very popular on the market and that can be a floated or a fixed system. But laminate floors must be a floated system. Okay, so they are a floating only system of installation, cannot be fixed down. Okay, engineered is the one that really spans the divide. You can do both. And then your solid products need to be fixed down. They cannot be floating. They just move too much. So now we've got, if we're looking at solid timbers, we've got structural and overlay floors. Now, what does that mean? So if we look at the photo on the left, what we can see is this is a structural timber floor. So if you think of your traditional tongue and groove hardwood floor or cypress pine floor, maybe in Australia, that's quite popular. That's spanning over the joists in a timber frame construction. So that's a structural timber floor. So it's designed to bear weight or to hold a person up or the room above it. So it's the actual structural floor of the home or building. An overlay floor is where the flooring is fixed direct to some sort of substrate. So it's fully supported. A nice way to think of this is a floor that's installed over particle board. Your particle board is the structural floor. Your flooring on top of that, your finished floor product, is your overlay flooring. 
The confusion can be that a 19 mil solid timber floorboard can be used as a structural timber floor or an overlay timber floor. So the installation of the product can determine its function. So it's still your finished floor surface, but a 19 mil thick hardwood board can be structural or overlay. You need to be careful though, because there are a bunch of products in the market that can only be an overlay floor. Okay, so we need to be a little bit aware of that. So installation essentials. There's three key steps to a successful project. This feels like one of those slides that you take note of if you're doing a CPD course. So the first thing to do is to know your product. Um, every product has different requirements and it's necessary to be familiar with both the manufacturer and the industry information pertaining to your product. So for manufactured products, this means reading installation and warranty guidelines carefully. And, and knowing if you're specifying into a product or you're buying a product or you're recommending a product or selling a product, you need to make sure that you understand the key requirements of that product as per the manufacturer. With solid timber floors, that means understanding the mill might have specific requirements, but it's understanding really the ATFA guidelines and the Australian standards around those raw materials. The second part of a successful project is to know your installation environment. So it's paramount that the subfloor and subfloor floor conditions are correct. Similarly, there are dry climates, humid climates, and the effects of heating and cooling systems can really impact on the performance of your timber floor product. So it's necessary to ensure that the product is suited to the in-service environment and that steps are taken to ensure that it is. What does that mean? It means that you need to understand what your subfloor is like. Is it going to have an impact on your timber floor? What are the conditions like? Are we in a humid condition, dry conditions? An extreme might be in an art gallery or, or a bank where we know that the air conditioning and the humidity is going to be controlled to 40%. That's going to have an impact on timber. So it's understanding that environment. And the third key step to a successful project is the combination of those two. It's about installing and, in, and specifying your timber floor product with understanding the limitations of the product in that environment. So take Lay the floor, taking the product knowledge and the site-specific knowledge into consideration. That's the key aspect. So know your product, know your environment, and then use an installation system that complies with those two requirements. So what do we do? How do we do that? Well, for solid strip timber flooring over concrete slabs, non joint So this is that, that timber floor, a solid raw timber floor product is the best way to think of this, a TNG floorboard. The top beyond that, we've got plywood on concrete. So plywood over concrete is a, a really stable way to install the floor. You make sure your concrete is flat enough. A layer of plastic or some sort of moisture vapor barrier must be there. Plywood is fixed to the concrete and then your flooring is secret nails and trowel glued or spot glued on top of that. Top nails in general are not quite effective in plywood because it's not thick enough to hold a long enough nail. Okay, so plywood on concrete, you're looking at a, a nail glue system and it's very stable and it's very successful. Overlay flooring. So overlay flooring is 10 to 14 mil thick solid timber floors. Can be trowel glued to concrete, um, but it's really only done in Western Australia. Um, a little bit in Victoria, um, not much in New South Wales and Queensland, um, not much in Adelaide either. So we've got more varied climates, but in Perth, um, the way the concrete slabs are generally constructed and the skill level um, on over generations in, in the Western Australian area means that overlay flooring direct to concrete is a bit of a Western Australian only system, but it can be done. Um, if you were to specify that into the Eastern states, you might have trouble finding trades to complete the work. When we're looking at battens on concrete, it's a similar system in that you've got a plywood and you've got a batten fixed to the concrete with a plastic layer underneath. Um, the difference being that a hardwood batten or a thicker softwood batten is long enough to start taking nails. So the main difference with this system is that it's not fully supported. So you need that structural timber floor to span the joists. Um, but you, you, if you use a thick enough batten, it can be top nailed. So wider boards, um, is where you sometimes need battens. I would be hesitant to be very reliant on battens over concrete floors. Um, because you've got those hollow cavities, um, you're more likely to get movement and squeaking of your boards, and you're more likely to get hollow sounds when walked on. 
um, and it can be difficult to remediate those issues. Uh, finally, we've got sheet subfloors over joists. So this is the particle board or an old CMG floorboard over joists. Um, pretty stable way to install a floor. One of the main concerns when you're going to an existing timber floor is that you do not have the ability to include a moisture vapor barrier. So whilst it's, you get a nice good spread of glue, you can put nails where you need to, it's usually nice and structurally sound, it feels good underfoot. There is no way to put a moisture vapor barrier between the subfloor, especially if it's a soil subfloor, and the, and the backside of your timber floorboard. We'll go that, through that soon. But one of the things to be aware of is that solid timber floors to timber subfloors on ground um, can be susceptible to subfloor moisture. If you're looking at acoustic applications, with a, so you're looking at adhesive fixed floors. So um, on the left-hand side here, you can see a block parquetry that's, a, that's fixed directly to a, an acoustic rubber underlay. Um, if you're using a solid timber floor, what we might be doing is it's plywood adhesive fixed to rubber, with then the flooring adhesive fixed to the plywood. Um, and with engineered floors, again, you can heat it adhesive fixed directly to the rubber underlay. Now, I'm going to get in a bit of trouble for the next thing I'm going to say, but there's a lot of single step adhesives on the market these days um, that are designed to be an acoustic layer within the adhesive. So there's no need for the rubber underlay. I would just advise that you carefully read the installation guidelines before using or specifying those products, as there's usually a minimum thickness of the adhesive required to achieve the acoustics necessary. And sometimes that thickness is a little bit unrealistic. Um, so just again, if you're using a single part, a, a three-in-one adhesive that's meant to be a moisture vapor barrier, acoustic layer and adhesive, just read the installation and warranty guidelines quite carefully. Okay, so we've got a floor system, we know what our subfloor is, and we know how we are meant to install that product. I now need to start to think about how much is it going to move? So we know it's hygroscopic. We know it's going to get bigger with humid conditions and smaller with dry conditions, but by how much and why? So this is where we come to a term known as the EMC or the equilibrium moisture content. What does that mean? Equilibrium moisture content is what moisture content does your piece of timber want to be at to be comfortable in the environment it's in? One of the really confusing things about moisture percentages and humidity percentages is that they're both referenced as percentages, but they don't mean the same thing. So relative humidity is how full the air is with moisture. So at 60% relative humidity, the air has got 60% moisture in it, and at 100% it's full and you get condensation. Okay, so that's it's how much air, how much water can be dispersed in the air before it becomes not a vapor and becomes a liquid. That's what humidity is. Moisture content of timber is what is the percentage of water compared to the percentage of dry wood. So 10% moisture content means you've got 10 grams of moisture in a 100 gram block of dry wood. So whilst they're both percentages, they're not equivalent to each other. If we look at the chart, you'll see that at 20 degrees Celsius and 60% relative humidity, Timber would like to be at an equilibrium moisture content of 11%. This means that if a board at 7.7% moisture content is introduced into that environment, it will take on moisture and expand until it gets to 11%. Conversely, if you bring a 16% moisture content timber, so 160 grams of moisture for every 100, for every kilo of dry timber, it's going to lose moisture and dry out until it gets to 11%. So what you'll see is that you need to have an understanding of what the relative humidity and temperature conditions will be in service so you know what moisture content your product will find its way to. So if you've got a dry environment, your boards are generally going to shrink. If you have a moist environment, your boards are going to expand. Okay. So what do we do about that? Why is that important? And we, this is where we come into some old information that's misunderstood. So what we do is we acclimatize our team. This means that we adjust the average moisture content of our products to suit the in-service environment. So we're taking that 7.7% dry timber that I've checked, and I'm allowing it to rise in moisture content to 11% before I install it so that it doesn't cause too many problems. 
I mentioned a bank before. So if you have an art gallery or a bank or a really strictly low community controlled environment, you're going to need to pre-shrink your timber before you install it so it doesn't shrink up. And what we end up with is this little chart here, which is actually in the Australian standard now. Timber flooring in Australia is manufactured to between 9 and 14% moisture content, but it's really between 10 and a half and 11 and a half or between 10 and 12% moisture content is where you will find the very vast majority of timber floor products, so solid timber floor products Australian produce, that's where they start at. So if you're going into a dry in-service environment, so something where you expect it to want to be 8 to 10, you need to acclimatise the boards first and allow them to shrink. Conversely, if you know you're going into a moist environment, so above 12.5% average moisture content, you need to allow for additional expansion and you might acclimatise the ports. If you're lucky and you're in Sydney like I am, the general expected in-service conditions for most locations is going to be between 10 and 12.5%, which is about 50 to 65% relative humidity. Um, and you don't really need to do acclimatisation because it can be installed as long as you follow basic guidelines. So this is a misunderstood concept of acclimatisation is that you always deliver the floor in early, you always leave it for two weeks and then you install the floor. And that's not correct. You acclimatise for the likely in-service conditions. Where we see this go wrong is flooring delivered to building sites, which have an abnormally high moisture content, high humidity, during construction, but at the when the building is finished and the flooring goes into its in-service conditions, it's drier. So if you acclimatise flooring in a building site condition, it will take on moisture and swell. But when you get to the eventual in-service conditions, the floorboards will shrink and you get gaps in your floorboards. And it's actually a really common problem. So understanding that acclimatisation is not always required, it needs to be specifically thought about and targeted. That's one of the main concerns with acclimatisation. So we need to assess the conditions in the install guides. So with seasonal highs and lows in humidity, flooring will swell and shrink. Solid timber floor does not shrink or swell appreciatively in its length, but engineered and bamboo floors move both in length and width. So due to house design, location, heating and cooling systems and seasonal variations, the exact movement is difficult to predict. And that's why expansion allowances are a requirement for all floors. So this is to the, the floor perimeter and vertical surface, but with wider floors and floors where greater expansion may be expected, such as a high humidity site, intermediate expansion allowance is also required. So we've got a gap around the full perimeter of our floor and in wide floors or floors where we think we're going to get excessive expansion, intermediate expansion gaps are instituted, okay? And this comes down to, so that's now, what type of subfloor have I got? What type of products am I using and how can I install that? And now I've assessed the conditions. Is my floor likely to be stable? Is it likely to get drier? Is it likely to get more damp and swell? And then, so you're factoring all of those things together, come up with a product and an install system that's going to be stable in relatively predictable conditions. Coatings and stains. So there are, there's probably a new solvent or a new type of coating in the market every six or so months. Um, and it can be very, very difficult to, to keep up with. Um, especially when you start introducing things like stains and colouring um, and you start to get mixed systems, it can be very difficult to know what works. I actually ran an in-house training program with my, my team at NIC today. And we were talking about how do we deal with customer expectations around colouring. And it, even for professionals, it's very difficult. So one of the key things to point out is that not all coating systems can be used on all timber floor products and sites. And especially with stains, not all stains can produce predictable results on all timber floor products and sites. It is very much a custom product and custom system when you're coming to colouring the stain colour, it's, it, it's, it's very difficult to specify a specific system on a variety of timbers. But what have we got? We've got penetrating oils and hard wax oils. But oil alkyds such as tongue oils, oil modified urethanes, acid catalyzed systems, one and two pack solvent based coatings, one and two pack waterborne polyurethanes, 
and soon to be one and two pack polycarb water based polycarbonate coatings. Okay, there's a lot of different flooring technology. The main ones that you're going to see in this day and age will be hard wax oils or oil composites and water based polyurethanes. They're the still the two most popular coatings. Solvent based coatings are on the way out, purely mainly from a, a health and safety and environmental impact standing. But you've got penetrating oils and hard wax oils and waterborne polyurethanes would be the two most common coatings that you're going to see on the market. Okay. And the different coatings produce very different results. In general, oils um, require much more maintenance, but they produce, uh, they're easier to maintain and they produce a more natural look. Polyurethanes and water based polyurethanes um, uh, don't need as much maintenance, but they're more difficult to maintain. It's more a set and forget finish. Um, so, understanding how the floor will be used. And how likely it is to be maintained by the users is really important. So if you've got someone who wants to re-oil and wants to rebuff their floor all the time and they want it to be perfect, then oils and hard wax oils is great. But if someone is not going to do regular maintenance, an oil or a hard wax oil floor is not for them because if you don't maintain it, it needs to be, it, it doesn't work. Okay. So they're better off with a water-based polyurethane. So it's not just the look you're after, it's What's the likely maintenance that's going to be carried out on that floor? It really needs to be considered. Okay. So, the final word on installs before we get into some problems. Um, the main and the keys to success is knowing your product and checking it prior to laying and being confident through assessment of your subfloor that it is right to accept the floor and then laying the floor to suit the requirements of the product for the installation environment it's being laid in. What? Know your product, know where it's going, know what it's going to do, and then install accordingly. So what is my product going to do? What is my site going? How is my site going to influence that? How can I install it in a way that's going to be stable? Okay, they're the three points. So, but it doesn't always work. So knowing how things can go wrong can help us understand how to avoid them. And knowing how to identify these concerns is always going to be part of the building process. Right. With timber floors, we've got two types of problems. We've got performance issues and we've got appearance issues. So performance issues will generally be related to the board, anything swelling, um, shrinking, gaps, uh, cupping, peaking. Appearance issues will mostly be to do with the coating, but it can be things like grading of the timber and colouring. Okay, So we've got performance issues and appearance issues. Referencing standards are going to skip past pretty quickly, but it's important that you look at the manufacturing standards, the installation standards, and the product performance and appearance. Okay, so obviously we've got Australian and New Zealand consumer laws. I mean, it's fit for purpose. It's done with due care and skill. But really, what we need to look at is the Australian standards. So 2796 for hardwoods. We've got engineered. There's no Australian standard or New Zealand standard for engineered or laminate floors. So it's generally a reference to a European standard. Okay. But there are also industry standards. So industry, ATFA publishes industry standards that are recognized in industry for almost all flooring products. There's a couple still to come, um, but they are the industry standards. So they fill the gap in the installation. So there might be a product uh, Australian standard, and there's sometimes there's an assessment standard by a guide to building standards and tolerances, but the actual install standard, that's where the ATFA industry standards come in. And of course, you've got all of these other resources. You've got information streets, uh, standards to tolerances guide, which I'm not a massive fan of. You've got um, the NCC government publications. There's lots of information to take on. But most of the problems that we see are covered in the ATFA publication, Problems, Causes and Remedial Measures. This is a, a little handbook, and I'm going to show you some excerpts from it, that goes through all of the different things that you might see in a floor. And, and it's categorized into hybrids and laminates, bamboos, engineered, solid, sanding and coating. It shows you some examples of what that could look like, how it could happen and what to do about it. It's a really great little guidebook to assessing concerns with any sort of timber flooring type product. Okay. With solid timber flooring, you're looking at things like cupping and peaking and crowning and gapping. So they're, those, they're the, the performance concerns. 
engineered floors, again, you've got performance things like um, cupping and bowing or movement under feet. Um, and then for sanding and coating concerns, it goes through the specifics of what the different types of coating concerns can be and how they're caused and how to fix them. They can be confusing. Coating concerns is, is a science and an art of its own, and they can be quite confusing. So that's a really good book to get. Um, you can order it through the ACFA website, or if you're a member, it's free. Um, really, really, really helpful. So let's look at some specific concerns. We've got cupping. So there's a couple of ways to cause cupping, and we're going to go through the main ones here today. So cupping from moisture beneath. So if you look, you've got a board as machine. We've got a tongue and groove board here that's got the uppercase, the core, and the lowercase. Now, cupping or the bending of a board occurs around the center line of the board. And you can see down the bottom here that if you get moisture introduced to the bottom half of the board, the board edge of the boards expand sideways. The lower portion of the board, which has more moisture, expands more than the top, and it, it expands more and it gets an upward curving appearance. Okay. So cupping from moisture beneath the floor, you'll have high moisture readings. The boards will be really tight together and you'll have that cupped appearance. And that's, that's a sign that there's moisture coming from below a floor. And that's when you see that moisture damage on side or the flood damage, this is what it looks like. But the same, so that's caused by what's called a moisture gradient. So you've got more moist at the bottom and less moist at the top. You can get the same thing by drying the top. So it will still be more moist at the bottom and less moist at the top or dry at the bottom and more dry at the top. So you've still got this situation where the top is narrower than the bottom of the board. The main difference in how it, it shows is that there'll be gaps at board edges if it's from drying above. So you'll still have the same board shape change. It's still caused by the same moisture gradient through the board, but if it's moisture from below, the floor is tight because it's expanding. If it's dryness from above, the boards will not be tight. There'll be gaps at board edges. Okay, It happens in things like direct sunlight in front of ovens and heaters sometimes around air conditioning floor vents, you'll notice it as well. So the moisture gradient both times, so a difference between the moisture content in the top and the lower case of the board, but one's expanding and one is drying. Okay. And this is the one that they get confused for. So peaking can look like cupping. So if you have a look at that center photo there or the photo on the top right, it looks like cupping. It looks like, oh, that's that thing where the boards get wet from underneath but it's actually not. So peaking is the floor just all getting bigger. So it's just responding to humidity or a moist environment. The boards push together and they crush slightly on the edges. So you'll notice that the, the photo on the, the left-hand side there, that the board is, is crushing a little bit from pressure. There's a little bit of a gap or an undercut in the bottom of the tongue and groove system and the top's nice and tight. So what happens is it expands, the bottom of the floor can move a little bit and the top presses upwards. So it's kind of like a little bit of a crush on the corner. How do you know it's not moisture from below? Well, usually peaking will be very consistent across the floor because it's not responding to a moist subfloor, it's responding to the humidity. Often it will be quite consistent across the whole floor and it's usually um, not as severe as cupping. Okay, so it's usually, it's, it's usually a little bit more mild and it's quite consistent across the floor. If you do a moisture test through the depth of the board, you also won't get a moisture gradient. It'll be 12.5% right through, for instance. Okay. So peaking and cupping can look different. So it can look similar, but they're caused by different things. So, but there's lots of others. Cupping, peaking, tenting, buckling, crowning. All of these different things are related to moisture changes within a board. And they all, uh, they're caused by different things and they can present similarly. So it's really important that um, if you're noticing a board shape change in a floor, that it's assessed correctly. Um, and that means usually assessing the timber moisture content and checking the average width of your boards. If you're having a problem like this that you're not quite sure, this is where the ATFA inspection system comes in. So crowning, peaking and undercut, and cupping, these are all the really main concerns that you're going to notice with solids in the form. If we look at appearance concerns, this is a little bit more difficult. So appearance concerns um, are common. Um, we get called out to look at quite a lot of appearance concerns, and it's usually to do with the, the sanding, the site sanding and finishing of a timber floor. Uh, it can be a new timber floor, it can be a refurbished timber floor. So there is an Australian standard, 4786.2, um, in regards to site finishing a timber floor, but it's not not great. 
We'll talk about that in a second. So remember, lots of coding choices, okay? So some systems are gonna be hard wearing, but not as easy to repair, okay? Some are gonna be better for install environments. Some are gonna be better with some fitness than others, okay? And they're all going to look different, okay? So it's important that we're, that the right coding choice is made. But even when the right coding choice is made, we can get some problems. The problems that we're looking at here, these are sanding concerns. So what we're looking at here is this is the sanding, the, the sanding of the timber with machines has caused these issues. So on the left, we've got chatter marks, okay, caused by bouncing of the machine as it runs down the floor. Sanding equipment marks is usually around the edges of a floor uh, where the edging and the, and the main body of the sanding interact. Swell marks or cobwebbing um, can be caused, by, that's by the buffing machines, can be scratching the floor, okay? And then dishing out of grain is about closing off the grain too much. So some of the concerns, while it looks like they're finished, are actually the sanding work that happened before the coating went on. One of the problems is that it's really, really hard to see those problems until you put the coating on, okay? So sometimes you don't know that there is a sander, you don't know they're there, and you put the coating on, you come back the next day and go, oh no, look at those swell marks, I didn't know they were there, okay? So when we're looking at the coat, so that's the same. When we're looking at coating imperfections, the Australian standard that I said I wasn't thrilled about has this big long list of things. And it says, the list above includes some of the things that could be expected to some degree in any raw finish. The list does not give any limits for rejection or acceptance, okay? And there's a really long list, look, A to J. It says, remember, this is a flaw that is being judged and the finish cannot be expected to be that of the quality of timber furniture. But what is okay? So it's saying to you, there's going to be a few scratches and gloss variations and dust and insects and bubbles and leveling and ghost marks. All of those things can be in your floor, but there is no guide to what's acceptable and what isn't. And it's this gray area that is very difficult when it comes to assessing how does a coating on a floor meet the intention of the standard or not. You do employ other documents. So you're still doing things. Um, so the various guides to standards and tolerances will tell us that we're standing back and we're looking down at the floor at a 45 degree angle with you know lights on and, and we're not being too concerned with glancing lights and all that sort of stuff. But it's still very hard to explain to a person that if you've got one ghosty mark in a 500 square meter floor, but it's right in the middle of the entry and it's white on a black floor, does that satisfy the standard or not? If you've got the exact same mark and there's six of them, but they're in a corner, is that okay? So it's very difficult to apply the Australian standard to a site assessment. You need to do it, but it's very difficult. So, but one of the things to be aware of is that there will be imperfections in your floor. What is less clear is how many is accepted. So what are the other base concerns? So with solvent-based polyurethanes, we've got some specific things that happen with solvent-based coatings. Um, and that includes, so hard wax oils, um, they would be considered a solvent-based thing. They're, they're an oil with a lot of hydrocarbon in it. So they kind of react, can react in similar ways. So they can be prone to edge bonding, so gluing boards together. And when the boards shrink, they let uh, an unevenly gap or it splits the boards. Solvent-based coatings attract more dust than gel particles. They change color under mats. And that's because they're yellow over time. So solvent-based coatings and natural oil coatings or synthetic oil coatings uh, yellow quite substantially um, with UV light. That's one of the things to be really aware of, okay? With water-based coatings, we get some different things, okay? So we get white lining and peeling. So this is where, uh, you know, when you bend a bit of plastic and it turns white, water-based coatings, and I've got it when the boards move, it's got a habit of doing a similar white sort of discoloration on board edges. Um, it doesn't mask color variations. So you'll find that solvent-based coatings bring out the richness of a timber, but it also hides some inconsistencies in the timber and water bases don't do that. Um, it can be more susceptible to chemical stain. So um, oil stains, um, my kids, blue textures last week, that was fantastic on my floor at home. Pet urine stains will stain water-based coatings more. And it can be more prone to grain raising because it's water-based when you apply the coating, it expands the top fibers of the boards and those raised grains can wear a little bit more quickly. Okay, so there's water-based coatings um, don't yellow in the sunlight, okay? They're far less likely to reject and attract dust and they dry faster and they're better for the environment, but they also don't wear quite as well and they're more susceptible to chemicals. 
surface tension related issues. So this is surface tension relates to how well a coating flows over the floor. So how well it disperses. Okay. So we get things like pitting, pitting, which is silicon or dust particles on the floor causing a surface tension issue. We can get quilting, so where you, the, the coating flows into the board edges. We can get rejection, um, which is like that orange peel effect where you get a rough surface where it hasn't dried properly. And we can get rejection of stain at board edges. So this is where the stain flows into the edge of the board and it pulls some of the, the stain with it. And you get this funny discoloration down the edge of the boards, particularly when you're trying to stain an old floor. So they are flow of, that's flow of finish concerns. Okay, They're a little bit different to application concerns. And with all that, then you've still got all of these other things. You can have gloss variations with solvent-based satin finishes. Okay, so the temperature of the time when the, when the solvent-based coating dries changes the gloss level. It can happen from day to day. It certainly can happen from, um, from site to site, but it can happen within a floor in room to room. We've got ghosting. So this is when you six or 12 months after you finish the floor, white boot prints or footprints appear in the floor and get darker and darker with time. Okay, and they come six months after the floor is finished. We can have application marks, we can have delamination, you have a whole bunch of coating problems that happen with floors. I would suggest that coating, if you've got concerns or two, two things, if you've got concerns with the coating going wrong on site, I would never try to assess it without uh, a professional assessing it for you. It's very difficult to know what's gone wrong. And all of these concerns can look very similar. If you're trying to um, specify a coating for a timber floor product, the, the product itself, so the raw material that's being used, will dictate what coatings can, can work, as well as the site conditions, okay, and then the likely maintenance. So the same as assessing a timber floor product for the environment, you really need to assess that the coating is suitable for the timber, for the environment, and the maintenance that's going to be applied to it. Again, you need to speak to your flooring contractors or flooring professionals or the ATFA to really understand what coatings are going to work where. If you've used a great oil-based coating somewhere on an American oak floor, and then you try and use it on a spotted gum floor or a brush box floor the next week, they're not going to perform the same. Okay. Same with water-based coating. I've used a water-based coating on a spotted gum floor and it came up brilliantly. But when you put it on black butt, you can get tenon stain and you have to change the solvents and you have to change the sealers. This in-depth knowledge of coating choices is very difficult to explain in a webinar. It takes a long time to understand and you really need to rely on your flooring professional to guide you with this. So, Australian standard 4786, not real helpful, okay? Read the product information on all of the different types of flooring, but rely on your flooring professionals. So even me, I run a flooring company and I've got contractors that do floor setting work for me. I still don't tell my specific contractors which brands of products to use. I might say we're doing a two-pack water-based polyurethane, but even within the different two-pack water-based polyurethanes, the different brands have different applications patient procedures, different role of thicknesses. Okay? And I allow my contractors to make that choice themselves, as long as it's high quality, because it's important that they are comfortable and knowledgeable in that specific process. Okay, So it's really important that you rely, of all of the things we've talked about today, coating choice um, really should be informed by your flooring professional. And then you've got everything that's not a coating. Okay, so we've got grades of timbers, nail uniformities, workmanship and um, silicons and beadings and trims. Okay, so there's lots of things that can go wrong around the floor, but the main and most difficult ones you're going to see about coating choices and sanding them. And we made it. So I'm going to hand back over to Alistair and he's going to do a little bit of Q&A for us, um, if I can find my taskbar. There we go. Thanks for that. Just follow this back up. All right. Thanks, everyone. So keen to get some of your uh, questions here. It's a fantastic presentation, Phil. You obviously know your stuff there, and uh, there's different things that uh, certainly uh, we need to be aware of. So um, please ask your questions, those people online. We've got some good questions here to start, start off. Um, a question here from uh, Richard about um, subfloor insulation systems. If you've got a suspended floor, which is an interesting one, do you have a preferred method for that? So, do the different sort of subfloor insulations impact on your flooring differently? Yeah, they do. And um, some of the products in that space are quite new. Um, so, there's uh, the foil foam insulations, there's hard um, cell insulations. One of the things to be aware of is that um, insulating the underside of the floor will 
help. I mentioned in the before, in the presentation that installing a floor direct to a timber subfloor exposes you to moisture from below. And insulation does help regulate that flow of moisture. So it can be really beneficial to insulate underneath a timber subfloor to prevent um, excessive movement in your floor. But what it can introduce is vertical movement. So I looked at a floor very recently where there was a, a 20 millimeter foam and foil insulation applied over the joist um, with a particle board on top and then the flooring. But what was happening is it was causing a little bit of compression in the between the flooring and the joist, which was leading to squeaking in the floor. So it's just being aware that insulation below your timber floor, yes, is great. Um, but if it's going to go over the joists instead of between the joists, you'll get better insulation, but you may introduce some movement in your floor and you just need to be aware of squeaking. But Richard was particularly interested in some of those cooler climate zones. He's talking about Ballarat, which we all know gets pretty cold, which is a climate zone seven. Is there sort of preferences for the colder climates? Yep. Yeah, so again, so um, but if you're, if you're talking about a timber subfloor, um, between joist insulation is better than over joist insulation in terms of floor movement. Um, and anything that can regulate both temperature and humidity because they affect each other uh, will help the performance of the floor. Just making sure we don't introduce a, a movement issue is really the only the downside that we see. But it, any sort of insulation is going to, it doesn't have any noticeable impact on moisture transfer. It can slow it down a little bit, but it's not significant. Um, but thermally, yes, for sure. Um, but just watch out for movement. Yep. Um, the question here on 19 mil flooring, which obviously you mentioned before is a thickness because it's spanning between a 450 floor joist. Um, how much can you sand off from a 19 mil hardwood flooring until you lose the structural integrity of the flooring? What's oh, the slide that I pulled out this morning because we were too long. Um, so if you're over, um, so about three-ish millimetres of wear above the tongue is what you need to be structurally sound with a high density hardwood. And it can be a little bit more than that with a softer timber like pine or radiata. Um, so, but a floorboard starts out with about a six mil surface and you're sanding something like one millimetres off that in your first sand and then a fraction of that thereafter. So providing the floor is reasonably flat, you're taking off 0 0.2, 0 0.4 of a millimetre per sand. And as long as you're left with three millimetres or above with a solid timber floor product, with a hardwood, high density hardwood, your black butt spotted gums, that should be structurally sound. Anything below that, you'll start, the first thing you'll notice is splits above the tongue and groove, you split on the top of the groove. And as soon as you start to see any splits in there, that's a sign that the floor needs to be replaced. So three-ish millimetres above the tongue for a high density hardwood, um, maybe three and a half for a softer, softer pine floor. Yep. In terms of uh, that cupping and peaking points, is, is there sort of a maximum cupping and peaking point where the timber eventually stops bending? Um, no, you'd be surprised. <laughs> um, a lot is the answer. So eventually <laughs> the cupping and peaking progresses too far, the lateral cumulative pressure in the floor will cause it to buckle. So if a floor gets takes on moisture, it's in a damp environment, a little bit of peaking will happen first. If you get moisture from below, the cupping will be extreme. It can be up to two or three millimetres. Beyond that, the floor will buckle. It'll either pull the subfloor apart or it will rupture upwards. So um, minor peaking and cupping may resolve itself, but more extreme than that, it will start to buckle the floor somewhere. Yep. I, I just note Rowan's made a comment here that he's pretty sure underfloor insulation and particle board is now mandatory on all stumps and bearer systems in Victoria. I definitely make that comment that now with energy efficiency regulations, particularly as we're moving to seven star in October, yeah, definitely subfloor insulation is something that you'd be doing with raised timber floors these days. Um, and there are a range of different products out there at the moment. And it sounds like an interesting sphere that we need to do a little bit more research collectively just to make sure that we've got what's what are the guidelines and systems in place that we can do some some quality underfloor insulation that's not going to impact on floor performance. Sounds like you've just Come up with a research project for me. Thank you, Richard. Much appreciated. <laughs> uh, Jerry mentions that uh, modern open plan living with large areas of glazing. And how do you get the message across to the homeowner that the flooring will shrink and look unsightly unless proper shading is provided? Um, if you know the answer to that question, we would love it. <laughs> <laughs> you just have to have the conversation. So it's about customer management and expectations. So um, all flooring products, including plastics, will respond to to the UV light and heat. Um, and it's making customers aware of that. We have a, uh, at NIT, we have a database of floors and, and pictures where we show pictures of floors exposed to sunlight, where you get coating discolorations, where you get gaps between boards. 
Um, it helps that we also sell shutters and blinds, so we try and upsell to that sphere, but it's important that that conversation is had. Um, not everybody understands, um, but posting choices and product choices become really important. So for instance, an engineered floor is going to move far less and produce less gaps than a solid timber floor, but it might discolor. So it's just about going through a, a really stick conversation with your customers and, and, and explaining the pros and cons. Mm -hmm. I was interested, uh, you spoke about the ghosting. Yeah, I hadn't seen that one before. There's a question here, that does ghosting, that boot footprints, does it disappear with time? No, it gets worse. Half not, how's it best treated, yeah. Yeah, so you replace the floor. Um, so ghosting is this, it's been a mystery. It's been, We're slowly unraveling it. One of the difficulties is that ghosting appears after six to 12 months and then collecting the data of how that might have happened 12 months after the fact is very difficult. But one, some things that we have noticed that it does seem to be tied to um, molded rubber molded sole shoes. So a lot of work boots are molded rubber. Um, we feel that there might be an association with diesel. So imagine you've got uh, a trade in his Hilux filling up with petrol, he gets a bit of diesel on his rubber boot and he walks in a raw timber floor. And then there's certainly a reaction between UV light and water-based coatings. So collectively, that means that if you've got a raw timber floor on a building site, it gets walked on with people with dirty shoes, and then you apply a water-based coating in sunlight, you're at risk of, of, of ghosting developing. So black butt and water-based coatings are the most common that we're seeing. It's a little bit unclear if that's because a lot of black butt floors with water-based coatings are on the market, but it does seem to be that the tenons in black butt in particular and something to do with hard sole rubber boots. In when you apply water-based coatings to those contaminated floors, it can produce ghosting. Um, if you don't sanding the floor more robustly certainly helps. Um, and using non-water-based coatings can help. But when we get ghosting on floors and we try to remediate it and change the coating systems, it, the success of that is inconsistent. So sometimes changing to an oil or an alkyd system or an acid cured system can help, but in other times the ghosting has come back. So the only advice we can offer is to try and protect raw timber floors from foot traffic uh, where possible on building sites. Um, and if you have concerns, um, it's about, yeah, maybe not water-based coatings and try and protect from sunlight, but it's, it's a problem that when it develops, it's very, very hard to fix. Mm. I'm interested, um, obviously 19 mil tongue groove flooring was our traditional method for many years and now pretty much uh, for our h and for issues or for a whole range of issues, um, yeah, the timber's laid on a substrate. How often do you reckon, what percentage of jobs would you see these days where tongue groove flooring is laid directly on a joist without particle board or something? Pretty it's rare. Ever, ever shrinking is the answer to that. It's ever shrinking. So um, one thing we do, so, so in Queensland uh, type homes, um, again, for thermal reasons, they're being changed, but um, a lot of insurance work. Um, there's a big storm in Australia every six to seven hours, it feels like at the moment. So for a lot of insurance work, you're replacing old tongue and groove floors directly to joists. But other, but in newer builds and certainly in new construction, it's um, very, very rarely. Yeah. And one of the main reasons for that is that you want to put the platform in, you want to do a platform construction and build on from there, and it doesn't make sense to expose your hardwood to, to that sort of damage. Yep. So very, very rarely a new build, but still relatively common in insurance work. Yep. So Jenny asks, uh, when using Australian timber engineered flooring installed over a concrete slab with slab heating directly, with slab heating directly glued to the slab, what's the most recommended timber species? Spotted gum is recommended often in Melbourne. Did you have a view there? Uh, it depends on the product manufacturer. So if you're going to use an engineered board, there should be uh, installation guidelines specific to the use of underfloor heating. Um, some producers allow it and some don't at all. One thing to be aware of that not only is there um, the depth that the insulation needs to be within the concrete slab, the when it's turned on, how hot and how long it's run for will all be stipulated in the installation guidelines. And if it's not, then you there are some uh, ATFA information sheets available on the use of underfloor heating. Um, the higher the density, the hardwood, so the less balanced the construction of the engineered floor is, and that's getting technical, um, the more likely you are to have an issue. So if you think of European oak, for instance, and it's on a birch uh, backing, the European oak surface layer and the density and the thermal properties of the birch back, so the oak and the birch are similar. 
So when that floor expands and contracts and changes temperature, it acts relatively uniformly. When you've got an, a spotted gum engineered floor, you've got a higher density hardwood that's a different coefficient of expansion on a plywood or a eucalypt back. So the top of the board has more structural movement. So heating that board up and drying it can cause more damage to a high density hardwood than it can to a low density hardwood. So ge very generally speaking, if you're looking at uh, medium density hardwoods, so things like European oak with thinner lamellas. So a four millimeter European oak product is going to be more stable than a four millimeter black bark product. And, and, and the same thing, so a three millimeter veneer is going to be more stable than a six millimeter veneer. But that's very general and really read the product specifications for, the, for what you're looking at. Yep. Uh, David asks about um, sort of putting in floors in very high humidity areas like in far north Queensland. He's got a project at the moment where they're laying a tongue and groove hardwood floor over a particle board substrate. Like what's your recommendation for installation there? I mean, would particle board be the right thing or plywood or fibre cement or is there a better thing in really high humidity areas? No, it's, it's more about knowing, having an idea of what's the internal condition going to be like. So um, when, when you're going direct to the particle board or you're going direct to any sort of substrate, you're going to be exposed to moisture from below. But in far north Queensland, the external humidity has its way of getting inside. So as a general rule, we try and average the 9 a.m. and 3 p.m. external relative humidity for the location, which gives you not, that's when a house is usually open. So especially in North Queensland, you might have, they use drafts through the middle of the day and then air conditioning at night. Um, so you need to get an idea for the average humidity. Um, Things, some general principles, um, narrower boards are gonna be more stable than wider boards. Um, a trowel glued installation is going to be better than a partially glued installation, but you will find that it's going to be difficult to acclimatize uh, completely. Uh, general advice, and I can talk to you offline about your specific project, but uh, an, an 80 mil wide board or a 90 mil wide board that's trowel glued with intermediate expansion, that's allowed to settle before you sand and polish it is probably the right way. So you know you're going to get some movement, but it's hard to allow for. So you install the floor with some intermediate gaps, let it move a bit before you sand it flat, and the trowel glued installation will retain some of that. That's going to put a lot of stress on the subfloor though. So you've got to make sure that the particle board is really well secured and screwed nicely into the joist. Looking at the other end there, Phil, uh, you mentioned earlier on, you know, sometimes with things like museums and banks, you're putting flooring into something and there's a really sort of low humidity, like a very climatized, uh, for, for very controlled conditions. Well, what, what would you normally recommend there? Would uh, would you want to actually be acclimatizing the yep. boards, leaving them in there with the HVAC system and things all running, like getting that temperature down? Yeah, running? so the only thing you can do in a low humidity environment is acclimatize. So you can have flooring produce the lower moisture content. So you have to be ordering enough timber and be friends with the guy who runs the kiln. But if you you can produce flooring to 8% and then keep it wrapped in plastic and deliver it to site. So it's it's ready for that environment. But you can't, there's no install method that we can do that's going to allow for contraction of the floor. So you have if you're trying to reduce cover widths, you need to acclimatize with the in-service conditions with the, the systems on and then install the floor. Um, the issue being that is that when a floor contracts after installation, it loosens the tongue and groove. So you don't get gaps you can't control, but a loosened tongue and groove is also prone to movement. So again, you might be thinking about doing a trowel glue system. So um, you might get some slight crown, some slight curving of the boards when they shrink, but at least they're not going to move underfoot. Mm -hmm. The pre-shrinking is the only real answer. Mm -hmm. Well, one of those things we used to do in the past or recommend um, when we used to do a lot of tongue and groove boards uh, straight over floor joists to stop the capping was to um, coat the boards on four sides before you laid them, you know, so that uh, it, it reduced the amount of uh, capping. Does that help these days when you're laying over a it's, substrate? Yes, it can. Um, it, it, what it does is it slows down the, regular, the, the flow of moisture. It doesn't stop it. But you need to be aware that unless you're going to put the same amount of coating on the back and the sides of the board that you do on the surface, you, you're still going to have an imbalance. Um, so yes, can help. Practically speaking, it's probably very rarely going to be done. Um, and underfloor insulation systems that I'm now going to be researching more robustly is probably a smarter way to achieve the same result. Yeah. Just one last question. Um, yeah, in your business, uh, what do you find is the most popular floor choice for clients these days? Whatever so I've got excess stock of. <laughs> <laughs> so, but no, realistically, we've, we've, there's been a move towards um, engineered floors for sure. Um, fixed engineered floors. So floating engineered floors, um, uh, I 
in my opinion, is that being shown as being a less sensible choice in that they, the movement underfoot and the compartmentalization trims and expansion trims for the for the spend, it seems to be going up a little bit. So I think that glue fixed engineered floors is certainly on the move, but we would still do probably 40% of all turnover in solar turnover. Mm. That's been fantastic, Phil. We're just sort of out of time now, but uh, been a huge amount of information there. So, so thanks for that. I uh, remind people uh, online that uh, ATFA's there to help you to when you're talking about floors. So if you've got a problem, you've got Phil's contact details now and you can see how knowledgeable he is. And also just pointing out all the great um, publications that ATFA obviously have as well and reminding you that uh, Wood Solutions does have a, a free um, a technical design guide on timber flooring, number nine, that you can download from the Wood Solutions website. So also a reminder to everyone that um, the webinars are recorded. So uh, if you want to go back and review this or if you thought that was valuable and you want other people to, to hear what was said, you can download that from our Wood Solutions website. Also, our next um, webinar it will be in one month's time. So Tuesday, the 4th of April, 11 a.m. And uh, we're doing a case study this time on the, born, the Bond of Norwest. So that'll be a really interesting one to tune into. So we certainly encourage you to do so. So thanks once again to everyone. Just on uh, midday now, it's been uh, great to present this to you again. Hope you have a great month. We'll see you again in one month's time.